What is the first thing that came to your mind when we talk about data analytics? Well, for most people, data analytics is mainly about analyzing structured data, which typically contains rows and columns. And the data usually comes from these systems in the typical companies such as HR, sales, finance, procurement, and vendors. And these systems will generate different types of data from the employee performance, transactions, income and expenses, account payable, and also cash flow. Uh, these are what is generally known as the structured data. And those are what data analysts and data mining people like us have been working on in the past. But what we didn't tell you is that only represents a small portion of the data that we captured today. So there are many other data like emails, PDF, Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, customer feedback, and product reviews that this sort of data we can analyze and extract more insights from there than the structured data. For example, if you're in the IT industry, right, you have many emails and phone calls that are related to technical support. If you're in the manufacturing line, then you have many lab reports. And if you're in the banking and finance industry, you have many legal documents and compliance reports to prepare. In fact, 80% of the enterprise data today is unstructured. So there are a lot more important insights, access that there's waiting for us to extract from this data and we're not doing so. And that's why today we're going to talk about how to unleash those potentials in text data using NLP and also Python. I'll cover the background tools and techniques and some of the applications that you can immediately apply at work. I forgot to introduce myself. This is your presenter, Dr. Lau here. I'm a PhD in machine learning, majoring in NLP or natural language processing. I was a keynote speaker for data science and developers matters for Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and basically to share my experience with the developers and data scientists so that they can understand how each other works better. Uh, most of them, they only have been on the one side of the table and I was lucky to have the opportunities to sit at both sides to know how to develop products and how to analyze data. I was also a state advisor for smart city and big data analytics, helping the state governments to identify viable solutions that help to run a data-driven smart city. I was also the Microsoft Excel expert world champion using Visual Basic scripts to run analysis way before we have Python and all the data mining tools. I was also working in Microsoft eResearch Center to create a platform that publishes agriculture census data that we have collected and shared it with researchers around the world. I also sit in the Ministry of Education's expert panels to audit the bachelor's and master's of data science programs for university. So I'm sharing all this information and background with you so that you have a better understanding about my experiences and feel free to ask me any questions that I'm, I'm able to help you with this experience. So let's get back to our topic. How important is text data? If we take a look at the data outside our work and look at the other data that we have generated, this is the amount of actions that we take based on the activities outside our work environment. For example, the minutes of YouTube videos that we have watched, Instagram photos that you have scrolled, tweets you have read, etc. Now from these actions, they are generating data in different forms such as images, audios, videos, and text that is just too difficult for traditional software, ERP, CRM systems, or even modern BI tools like Tableau or Power BI. They, these applications just don't understand and they just can't analyze this unstructured data. So most of the companies, they just leave them aside. And in particular, images, audios, and videos they are very high dimensional and usually require specialized knowledge and usually require specialized knowledge in order to extract useful features and put them into applications that can quickly generate profits. Whereas it's a lot easier for us to obtain, process and analyze text and the technologies to analyze text are already pretty mature. The recent researches on language models like GPT, BERT, and GAN for automatic writings, they have all achieved significant breakthroughs thanks to deep learning. And if we look beyond academic researchers and look at some consumer products, say Apple HomePod, Siri, or Google Home, Alexa, they're sort of similar voice control devices. While it seems like the user interface is simple and the user experience is smooth, the processes behind are not. 
It involves the steps from detecting speech, converting those speech into signals, and turn them into text. And then, from these texts, we need to analyze the user's intention to identify the questions, actions, and also the keywords. And from there, we need to decide what actions to take or what results needs to be returned to the users. And then we use a text-to-speech synthesizer engine to respond. And we can see that a large portion of these processes is relying on assisting technologies on text. We can't perform those actions without being able to understand what the text is about. And therefore, text analytics play a crucial role in the unstructured data processing. So, how does natural language processing work? Natural languages refer to a language that's developed and evolved naturally in humans, such as English, Chinese, Bahasa, Russian, Thai, and Japanese. And the processing part means that we analyze the content to extract meanings, intentions, semantics, and use this information to carry out specific instructions. A typical NLP project contains five steps, which are tokenization, stop word removal, stemming, lemmatization, and also part of speech tagging. Let me show you how it works using this sentence as an example. So if we have a sentence called the quick brow fox jumps over the lazy dog, the first step we want to perform is to chop the sentence to the smallest information you need, which is a term or word. So this process is called the tokenization. Then, we need to consider one thing before we proceed to the next step. Is every word here meaningful? Probably not. Some of the words here like the and over, they are not useful, as in they do not provide extra meaning for the machines to understand the context of our text. These are what we call the stop words. Stop words take up unnecessary memory and storage space and it slows down our computational time. If we don't remove them, the dimension of our text documents will grow huge very quickly. So they should be removed, and this process is called the stop word remover. Then we will perform stemming. Stemming helps us to normalize the words back to their root form so that they will not be considered as different words. For example, if we have these words jumps, jumped, jump, and jumping in our document, it will all be reduced to its root form, jump. This is a simple and straightforward approach that we just chop away the last few characters of a word to get their root form. But things are always not that easy. Sometimes we'll have a tricky scenario, for example, mice and mouse, eat and ate, flew and flown, drank and drunk, standing and stood. We can't simply return them to their root form just by chopping away few characters. And that's when we need a more advanced technique called lemmatization. And lemmatization uses a dictionary called WordNet to reduce these words to their root forms. Lastly, we'll perform the part of speech tagging to identify the role of a word in our document, such as the adjectives, or the verb, and also the nouns. Now that we have pre-processed our documents, but don't forget, they're still in the text form which means the computers or machines are still unable to process them and extract information just yet. What we need to do next is to extract features from these documents, meaning to turn this text into computational forms so that we can perform other actions on them. Now before that, I want you to take a look at the following documents. I'll give you 30 seconds for that. Imagine a user that just came in and browsed our collection and want to search for a documents with a keyword cat. How do we know which documents are they looking for? And how do we sort these documents by the relevance? An intuitive way is to count the number of times the words cats appear. So meaning the more it appears, the more relevant it is. 
This might work for the first document since the word cats appear three times here. But what about the rest of the documents where cats only appear once in all of them? Or what if another user came in and he wants to search for the word sunny? And that's when we need another measurement called the document frequency to help us to measure how many times a term appear in our collection. Document frequency represents the number of documents where a term appears. For example, it, the word cats appear in all six of our documents, so it has a DF of six, and sunny appeared twice, so it has a DF of two. But this representation is still inaccurate because we're measuring the global importance of a term, not the local importance anymore. So if the word cats appear in all six documents, meaning this keyword is too common, so the score should be lowered. And rare keywords like sunny and flum, they deserve a higher score because of its uniqueness. So computer scientists are very smart. What they do is to divide the document frequency by the total number of documents, and then they call it the inverse document frequency or IDF. And by inversing the document frequency with the total number of documents in our collection N, we can immediately see that the effect of frequently appeared term being reduced significantly. For example, the importance of cat is now 1, and from the macro perspective where we look at the collection, this is accurate. But we still have another problem, because this method overpowers the rare terms such as flum. Although the word flum and sunny they are rare, but intuitively speaking, its importance cannot be 6 times the importance of cat and the word sunny cannot be twice the importance of the keyword flume. If you really can't feel it, it's mainly because the collection of our document size is really small. If you look at a collection size that is huge like Google, it wouldn't make any sense if an importance of a keyword is a million times more than the other keywords. And therefore, we have to use another function called log to calculate our IDF. Now in mathematics, the logarithm is the inverse function to the exponential. So logarithms are a convenient way for us to express large number. And by applying it to the IDF, it helps us to present how IDF increases in a way that's more gradually and less dramatically. And if you take a quick look at the table and also the chart, we can see that the log 1 million is only equals to 6, which gives a smoother scale when our data collection size increases. And let's apply IDF to our collection now. And we can see that even in such a small collection that we have, the effect of log functions makes the importance score of our uh, keyword more realistic. And this is actually the infamous TF-IDF feature extraction, which is the basis of almost all the natural language processing and text analytics work out there. So now, the remaining tasks are easy. All we have to do is to convert our terms from the documents to a numerical form. Or to be exact, we want to project them to become a vector. Now, if you don't really understand the concept of vector or you have forgotten about it since, since it has been a while from our high school, uh, you just have to remember it's a measurement that has both directions and a magnitude. So uh, imagine we have two documents and it, it's a representation of the keyword and its strength here mathematically. And then, in order to measure the similarity or to compare these two documents, we'll use a formula called the cosine similarity. Now, as the name tells you, cosine similarity measures the similarity between two documents using the cosine formula, which ultimately means we are measuring the angle between these two document vectors. And the values ranges from zero, which means they are completely not related to one, which means the two documents are completely identical. I hope I didn't lose you at this point yet, and because you might thought that, well, Dr. Lau is asking you to program everything on your own. Luckily, we are using Python, so that we don't have to rebuild everything or reinvent the wheel that I have mentioned and start all over again. 
but I can't guarantee that if you are using other languages like Ruby, JavaScript, or C sharp. Okay, now the one library that you need for natural language processing in Python is the NLTK, which stands for Natural Language Toolkit. Now, NLTK is a leading platform for Python programmers to work with uh, natural language and text data, and it provides all the functionalities that I've just covered, which allows you to handle text documents at ease and is a very scalable uh, toolkit to use. And on top of that, it's also able to perform sentiment analysis out of the box, which means you can easily analyze how your customers feel about your services and products with just a few lines of code. So all you have to do is just to import the NLTK package and download the lexicon. And the lexicon is for us to assess the uh, importance or the weights of a particular uh, term. And all you have to do next is to initialize an instance of sentiment intensity analyzer and call the polarity scores function on a sentence or a paragraph or the document. And then it will return you with a dictionary which contains compound, neck, new, and positive. The compound score is the final result that we want. So if it's a score that uh, range from negative one to positive one. So in this case, 0 0.5093, which means it's a positive sentiment with 0 0.5093 as the strength of that sentiment. And negative stands for the uh, negativity of that particular uh, document. So in this case, it's zero because this is a very positive sentence. I'm, I'm very happy to be invited to speak at PyCon APEC 2021. And then there's neutral. So neutral is to measure the neutrality of this particular document and of course the positivity as well. NLTK already can handle most of the NLP tasks. And if we combine it with other packages such as Beautiful Soup for web scripting, uh, Spacey for heavy duty modeling, and Jensen for topic modeling and embedding, I'm sure that you can build some solid text analytics applications in a short amount of time. And perhaps let me show you a few examples on how we can actually build NLP applications and that helps with our structured data. And the first one is Corona Tracker. Corona Tracker is a classic example that benefits from uh, analyzing text data and using it together with structured data. Corona Tracker is a COVID-19 data collection platform where myself and a group of volunteers built uh, during January last year. And that's when the pandemic has just started. And this is not a dashboard. Yeah, if it is, then it will be very boring because there are hundreds of different COVID-19 dashboards out there. Uh, but if you notice, most of them, or if not all of them, right, they are only analyzing structured data, showing you the, the trends and statistics on the number of confirmed cases, recovery, deaths, etc. Which we have it here too, right, as you can see. But Given my background in natural language processing, I want to give our users more information and more depth. I don't want just to be uh, centralized data storage showing numbers and charts. I want to give more information to people who want to know more about the development of the virus. And you can see here uh, more in-depth news coverage in different languages. And another thing that we have done is to make sure that we show only truthful and validated informations. Uh, at least they are validated by, they are written by the journalists and trusted uh, reputable publishing house or news outlets. And we prevent people from uh, sending messages from random websites or WhatsApp groups. So we do a lot of uh, NLP uh, processing tasks over at the back end. And then another extension of uh, that comes out from Corona Tracker is actually COVID19AI.org. So what happened is uh, there are a lot of research papers 
uh, being published during this period. So this system crossed through all the research papers related to COVID-19 and sort them according to their keywords into different themes so that uh, researchers can quickly identify the themes and the trends of the research that they are looking for and so they can quickly understand the development of different pillars like vaccines or uh, recovery etc. And there are other ways that you can use NLP, of course, outside of the pandemic or building a repository like that. Uh, first thing first, you can build a search engine. Of course, I'm not expecting you all to build another search engine you know, to go against Google. But there are times where you need to build your own in-house search engine or like a mini Google. And that will index all the documents that you have in your organizations. And building your own search engine can be beneficial uh, for a long existing company uh, as well as startups because it helps to keep track of your competitions and gather important data about your customers and competitors. And this is especially useful for large companies who has its own internal knowledge base or wikis already, uh, like companies like banks or those sensitive industries that always need to deal with regulations, regulators, and handling compliance issues. A second thing, chatbots. Well, chatbots were once very hot in the past, maybe one to two or two to three years. And to a certain extent, I always thought that you know, chatbots are overrated. They're just text-based um, telephony systems. And many companies that deploy chatbot solutions just as uh, non-human alternatives so that they can provide pseudo customer service 24-7 you know, like those that say press 1 for English and press 2 for credit card services that sort of things but I believe that the real purpose of chatbots is, is to streamline the interactions between people and services so that we can enhance our customer service and this they offer the companies new opportunities to improve their customers' engagement process and also their efficiencies by reducing the typical cost of customer service. All right, this is the ideal scenario of implementing chatbots properly. So uh, we haven't seen a really good example of those. So there's still uh, quite a, a, a lot of opportunities there. And the next thing is to analyze product reviews. Now I have shown you uh, the, the examples of use case, how we can analyze the text. And if you imp apply this in the service industry by analyzing the reviews, say uh, for, for hotel customers or product related companies, e-commerce sites, um, basically any service industry, right? Uh, this will allow us to analyze reviews at a scale that is difficult to be performed by a human. And then we can we can quickly identify and fix issues with our products and services. And we can also find out what are the main problems that prevent people from making uh, purchase decisions. And this will all ultimately improve our business processes. And last one is the automatic writing. Yeah. And of course, the, the machine can't write a novel or fiction yet uh, that will become a bestseller. But the rise of GPT-3 and deep learning has made it possible for machines to write content automatically. At least, you know, they write for the machines to understand. That's totally possible. So what does it mean, right? It, it means you can build an AI writer that learn your tone, your emotions, and help you to write content, or maybe re recycle some of your existing content that's targeted for SEO. Because those articles are meant for Google and Google robots to read in order to index your size. And of course, you can uh, use it to respond to standard inquiries on Facebook, Instagram, rather than you know, just using PM, private messages, or manual inbox all the time. So by now, I, I hope that you have a very clear idea on what the NLP or natural language processing is about, what it can do, and what are the uh, potential possibilities out there. And if you want to implement uh, natural language processing in your work or in your organizations, uh, here's, here are some of the, the steps that I will suggest. Step number one, 
is start to identify useful text data in your organization now. Uh, it can be text data from social media, customer reviews, product reviews, especially if you are doing e-commerce like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can also collect anonymized data such as employee feedback, customer support emails, and or their, their chat, chat logs with the customer serv service officer, especially if you are in the service industry. And this data can almost be used immediately to correlate with your structured data and unlock some instance business value very quickly. Step number two, assign data owners. Well, it seems that everyone can access to the text data and start using it, right? But if you don't assign a data owner to it, I can guarantee you that nothing will happen. As you can see, Text data is a high dimensional data and messy in nature. So it's not a, a data like a structured data that every, anybody can just go in and run some uh, SQL queries and get some results out of it. Yeah? So it's very important to identify a data owner that maintains the data and it has to maintain the data recency and also the data quality. Data ownership is not just a rule of simply a position. It's more of a mindset, yeah? it's, a, it's a commitment. So the person who is uh, willing to, who, who takes up this position, he must be, they must be willing to understand the data, spend time understand the data, clean the data, and they believe that the data, text data is useful. And most important thing is they must have a strong drive or urge to make good use of this data to improve the decision making process. Lastly, start small, think big, and scale fast. I've seen many failed projects that did not follow these steps. Uh, some even reverse or change the order, start big, and then they keep shrinking the, the scope. And of course, eventually they won't be able to execute or scale fast because they keep moving the goalposts. Uh, do not think of using text data from every department or the whole company just yet. Start from a small use case, ideally like a department level at least, and then think of how we can expand it to a larger user base. Have that in mind, but don't have to rush into it. And even for customers, we do the same. Yeah? Do not apply it to all the customers yet. Find a small group and test it with them first. Often, you will then be able to figure out how to scale automatically by then. Uh, thank you very much and I hope you have learned something useful today uh, from how to analyze text data and if, uh, enter a whole new world of analyzing unstructured data. Text is just one of them that has high business value and of course visit the site to get more free data science tips and tutorials. And you can also connect with me on social media as I often share some industry insights and quick tips too. All right, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions now. For to begin with our uh, q and A, I'd just like to give a short introduction. Our main person for this afternoon is the CEO of Lead and the Chief Data Scientist. You know, he is the trainer and keynote speaker in data science and AI for major companies. He had a very, very long list on his resume. <laughs> you know, I've I've read that. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, yes, yesterday I think or the other day. Now, um, he helped major companies, organizations, and government agencies, Australia, Malaysia, Taiwan, and other Asian countries. So he has trained and advised in many of the organizations, includes Intel, Standard Charter, IBM, and Telecom Malaysia. He's been invited as a keynote speaker in different data science events. So I think he really knew what he's talking about. So without further ado, I'd like to give you Dr. Che Han Lao. Good afternoon, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Neil. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I hope you guys have uh, listened to my talk and, and learned something from there. And I'm here to answer your questions live. Yes, it was, it was really an eye-opening talk. You know, I think people, uh, even people from data science or who do like data AI and machine learning. I was really surprised when, when you pointed that out on your talk, uh, Dr. Lau, about the amount of data that we overlooked, right? Yeah. Yes, 
you know, yes, we process you know, data, but when you do the iceberg analogy, <laughs> you know, the structured data versus the unstructured data, I was really surprised. Could you could you pound more on that one? Sure. So often, because you we have we have quite a bit of history when it comes to analyzing structured data, and you know, I I started learning SQL in late eighties or early nineties, so it's about you know, thirty years from now, and things things haven't changed much, right? I think people people are still talking about you know analyzing structured data, and you if you if you especially where we're we're speaking on on APAC level, a lot of the companies mm-hmm. they are small medium companies and they are still happily using Excel to handle their rows and columns using functions and formulas. So what people neglect is that, you. See, and then on the other hand, you hear a lot of people saying that, oh, I would like to learn big data, I would like to take part in this you know, AI, uh, but I don't have data. But what they forgot is that data is everywhere, right? A lot of, every mm-hmm. every single thing that we do today, we, we generate data, we leave a digital footprint. So, and we should go around and look at things like that and not just everybody just trying to squeeze through the, the tiny little door of analyzing numbers and rows and columns. That that's the, my main point. Mm. No, no. When did you when did you started to point to the direction of the text data? I mean, when did it dawn on you, or when did you like come up with the idea? Okay, we've been looking on the structured data. How about the unstructured one? W- what what made you think about that? So I it was about two thousand seven, two thousand eight. That time when I was about to, I, I completed my bachelor degree and I was about to do my masters, and uh, that wow. that was also the time where Facebook and Twitter they have just started. <laughs> so we we know that. Uh, Google has done a, a good job in translating short queries into long document. If you think about it that way, right? Google does not need you to type everything. You don't have to describe, you know, I'm looking for an Apple iPhone uh, Pro Max or whatever, right? You just need to type iPhone or you just need to type Apple iPhone and they will, Google knows what you want. So they have, yes. they, have, they have done a great job in terms of translating small query and, and understand your intention. But when it comes to a short, short text, right? Like when your users write a piece of review or command on your product, what does it mean? How do you utilize that information? And then when somebody express their opinions on Facebook and uh, on Twitter and also our, our messages. So those are relatively, comparatively much shorter documents. And that's the time when I realized that, wow, there's a lot of things that can be done. Because we have done uh, natural language processing uh, but using yes. statistical method, right? Not mm-hmm. in particular... Uh, from the angle of analyzing it for the sake of understanding customers, uh-huh. we've done it. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and you see that only up to lately, when we have those deep learning models, we are we finally able to take that to Bird or GPT three to the next level. But before that, yeah, the the natural language or unstructured data processing has been like that for 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 quite a number of years. So I think it was just doing the the right thing at the right time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I like I like that you pointed out what Google uh, have been doing. I mean, I guess Google really was so ahead of their time, you know, yes. if we might say something like that. But in your own perspective, is it really what, uh, would it be really like predictive or generative? Where Where do you think we are headed? Is it really on the predictive type or on the generative type in the future? Sure. So that that's a really interesting question because we, I I don't think we need to generate more data. Where as in, if you just see natural language or unstructured data as mm-hmm. generative model, meaning that I'll just press a button and is is able to help us to generate uh, one million articles based on the keyword that you have used. Or if you mm-hmm. if you if you look around, there are quite a number of. Uh, sales sales articles, automatic sales article generation. So you basically just need to give them a, a product uh, description and they will help you to write a blog post. Hey, this is the best uh, you know, cleaner in the world, blah, blah, blah. I don't think we are heading towards that direction, but we are heading towards more in between human machines and machine and machine understanding. So it's more about the analysis of the intent. So the generative 
um, tags or GAN model or whether is it predictive mm -hmm. model, these are just a subset of the application. So they all come from because we are now finally able to move towards like human understands the machine more and machine is able to understand human more. And if you look at the other side of the application, say Siri, Alexa, or those voice mm -hmm. uh, applications, right? And those are mm -hmm. exact use cases of NLP as well, of analyzing unstructured data. So we have a lot of interesting branches out of analyzing unstructured data, but I, I, I don't think we are specifically heading towards a particular direction in terms of use case. Oh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. It, it also, it also, uh, I, I think it's also part of what you wanted to promote, you know, that using text or processing text. Now, like, Translations. Let me go to yes. translation. Translations had been getting better and better through the years, right? Yep. Do you think? Do you think analyzing text and and you mentioned Alexa, you mentioned Siri. There are also now voice activated translation devices wherein they would speak the native language and it will translate in English or or, or vice versa. Do you think it, it is more of that? They are now because they are now processing the unstructured data. That's why they're coming up with those kinds of things. Yes, certainly. Because if you look at now, if you, if you take a look at what Apple is doing, right, or iOS is doing, we we know that they always came late to the party, but they always take whatever that we have used to the next level. So recently, they have just released the so-called live text features, which we Android users have already been using that for many years, and you finally get <laughs> highlight text from from those images and stuff. And that is exactly the the move that we are going because they are also trying to make us to help them to train their machine to understand more about what those texts are. And if you remember, right, nowadays, uh, when we are using CAPTCHA, we are helping Google to recognize those logos, icons, traffic, mm -hmm. uh, road signs, and what, what not, right? But a few years mm -hmm. ago, we actually helped Google to do the CAPTCHA by recognizing text. So Google scanned a lot of text from um, New York Times and all the old newspapers, and whenever they want, you want to access some of the service, prove that you are not a robot, and then they show you a piece of text, right? Instead of a picture. Wow. So they have done all those things already, and then now they move on to images. So that is exactly where I see we are heading. Wow, that that is really interesting. Now, to 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 relate this with with what we are doing or what you are promoting and doing now, how do you think Python now and Python into the future will? What is the role that it will play? We know that Python is good in machine learning in yes. AI, but is there anything else that you'd like to see with the software uh, that that would really help us? learn more you know so to speak yes so i think i think uh john jordan was there yesterday when we talk about uh doing social goods and doing you know using machine learnings and stuff and one thing i really would love to see out of python is that can we use this to help to better with the the biases and all the i wouldn't call them discrimination you know or racism uh -huh. directly towards that but we want to present a more equal opportunities to everything that we are doing right it's all about using technologies for for, for humanities for human goods and when we are using Python for this, can we use Python to identify something? Let's say, all right. So we know that this particular model that we are training, uh, one of the things that we, we, we always talk about is job matching. Because if we use AI model oh. to filter candidates, to look for people who are suitable for the job, they are always biased to the training data. Right? They're always biased to the training yes. data. So if you give yes. a, a, a list of, uh, let's say, training data about software engineers, then we can expect that at least 70% mm -hmm. of those are guys. Even, those which, even though we try to hide the gender information, we try to say, you know, let's, let's get rid of the sex column, you know, let's get rid of the names column. <laughs> yeah, you, names don't know, column. you don't know what is our name, you don't know what is our But there are still information <laughs> that reveals that, hey, this guy likes to play basketball, this guy likes to play golf. So it's more likely that this is a guy, right? So from a data-centric yes. approach, can we use 
Python and all those existing mature library to help us to mask this information, to present a more equal opportunities to everybody when we are making those decisions. Because these decisions are not only hurting the, the less, the, the one those are affected. So we, if we say this is a men and women problem, right? We say 75% of those are men and then 25% mm -hmm. of those are women. Okay, that's fine. But to a company, you are also losing the chances to hire women who are <clears throat> probably a much better candidate because of the model bias. So in a nutshell, it, I, I'm looking forward to work together with different organizations and uh, Georgie, myself, uh, Ivy, and we're working with Microsoft to, to turn this into something that can be a solid model and put it into a public platform like Azure and for other people to use. Mm, yeah, I, I really like what Gene uh, put on the chat box. He said, I think it should be a wider conversation within the society. And yes. I, I really like what you pointed out about the bias, you know, the bias that we would always have. I mean, as long as human really work with data, big data, what do you think, Dr. Lau, we will come to a point that we could really interpret data without bias? Yes. Do you think so, it's really possible? Yes, modern approach, uh, modern problems require modern approach, modern tools, modern solutions to solve it. So we are the one that create this massive beast by generating that much data. And we, we will only get more data because our data is increasing, is growing exponentially. And look at APEC as, as its own, right? We, our adoption of 5G is not as, as popular, as fast as you know, US, Korea. And when 5G finally comes, what will happen? We'll have more data. So definitely we will just, I'm, I'm just going to say that yes, and we do have no other approach. It's not about just getting more humans to do the labeling, to do the tagging, not, not so, yeah, right? Because the, the opposite is not true. So I'm going to say that we're going to reject the approach and move towards using a tool-based approach like Python and whatnot to, to help to solve this problem. Mm, a pretty, pretty interesting thought about this one, you know. And and uh, as I've said, and, and as what have been, uh, Jane had been posting on the uh, live chat, you know, yes, it is hard, but of course we should try. Right? Yes, <laughs> I mean that. I think I think that is the beauty of everything that uh, we we do, you know, as as part of this community, this active or this very beautiful community, Python, and and we know that Python also will be helping us down the road you know, by creating something, you know, and, and yeah, uh, the future, nobody can foretell, but I think, you know, we could still train everything. Yes. Any last words you'd like to say, Dr. Lau? I think I would like to echo what Nell has said, right? You have tell the, the best way to create the predict the future is to create the future. So the future is in our hand, right? And we were the lucky one. So every Pythonian that is here, that are here, that we, we, we are lucky and fortunate to be able to learn and pick up a tool like Python that is easy to use as a beautiful language. So why don't we use this tool and make the world a better place and let's do, do it together, right? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, that, thank you so much, Dr. Lau. As much as we wanted to have you more, uh, you know, you can jump around on the open space if people yeah, no still problem. like to ask you a question. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Gene. Thank you for uh, moderating the room. It's really, as what uh, Rose said, it's really an eye opening thing. And we've learned a lot in this conference. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank let's you. Thank you Dr. very much. Yeah, thanks for having me thank here. You. And let's connect, all right? Let's chat more. Thank you very much, Neil. And yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right, bye for now. See you next time.